In the afternoon of Thursday 8th of August, we made our way from Nottingham to the East Midlands Airport to board an Orion Airways flight to Naples. On arrival, we made our way to the Hotel Gallis in the Megalene area, a B&B recommended in the rough guide. My recollection is that we found the hotel noisy because the next morning we moved on to the Pensiona Alsonia a few minutes away on the Naples seafront. In the next few days we explored the streets of Naples and the sulphurous town of Pozzuoli, the birthplace of Sophia Loren, now a suburb of Naples. At the weekend we boarded a ferry to the island of Procida, an unassuming place off the tourist trail. And we found a small resort along the railway line a few miles down the coast on the Bay of Naples at Vico Equenze. It had a small public beach. It seemed a pleasant place to stay and we booked into the Hotel Astoria, conveniently next to the Vico railway station. We spent the next few days swimming at Vico and making our first visit by boat to Sorrento. On Wednesday the 14th, we returned to Sorrento, this time by train. My diary tells me that we did not like Sorrento. It was packed with people and there was almost no public beach. But we stayed into the evening and had a meal at a rather dismal restaurant, La Grief. It was while we were in the restaurant that Richard mentioned something that he had said earlier in the day while we were having a beer at an outdoor cafe, which I had dismissed as fantasy. I thought we were being followed. I don't remember exactly why I thought that. It was just a sense that I had. Fifteen minutes later, we were back at the Hotel Astoria in Vico Equenze, gave our room number at the reception and asked for our room keys. As I took the keys, a man in uniform holding a gun appeared at my side, and two or three other men in plain clothes surrounded us. They escorted us to our room on the first floor, which they searched haphazardly, looking on shelves but not opening the wardrobe or searching us. They find some white powder in a sachet in the bathroom, which they thought was cocaine. Actually, it was Entrasan, a treatment for diarrhoea. And they found Arabic writing, or so they thought, in my city councillor's diary, but it was actually Pittman's shorthand. They also found a Moroccan stamp in my passport, which seemed to seal the deal. The man with the gun was the head of the local carabinieri, Comandante Michele Tatarelli. Still wearing shorts and t-shirts from our time in Sorrento, we were ushered into a black limousine. Flashing lights and sirens were turned on and a car set off, accompanied by the plainclothes men on motorbikes in front and behind us. They drove at speed through the town centre. People had to jump off the roads onto pavements and, just to show what important prisoners they had, they made a second circuit of the town. We thought this was highly amusing and we climbed in the back seats of the limousine, giving royal waves to the astonished pedestrians. The vehicle came to a stop after entering a compound surrounded by high metal stakes. An electronically operated gate rolled shut behind us. We ceased to be amused. First of all, we were taken to an interview room with our hotel manager, who had come as interpreter, where we demanded to speak to the British Embassy. This was refused. Sometime later, a brigadier from the Carabinieri local headquarters in Sorrento arrived, took me away to another room and questioned me. After about three hours, when it was approaching midnight, we were transferred to a small reception area furnished with orange plastic chairs. And it was there that the hotel manager gave us the first hint that we were suspected of being international terrorists. We sat in the reception and tried to doze. Every hour, one of us, or both of us, would march down the corridor and demand of Tatarelli that he phone the embassy to no avail. 
About 4 a.m., a man calling himself Chief John Case arrived from a U.S. naval base. He spent an hour with Commandante Tattarelli and then came to talk to us. He was, he said, an expert on passport forgeries, drug trafficking and international terrorism. He also explained that an article about a former CIA agent, Frank Turpil, who had been trafficking drugs for arms for Idi Amin in Uganda and after his downfall for Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, had appeared in the Naples newspaper Il Mattino. We later read that Turpil had been indicted by a US court on charges of providing 20 tonnes of plastic explosives and 10,000 machine guns to Gaddafi and was sentenced in absentia to 51 years in prison. We were shown the article about Turpil and it was clear that he bore a strong resemblance to Richard. Richard looked less like his own passport photograph and more like Turpil in 1985. He was also the same height, age and weight and had been in Agadir at the same time as Turpil earlier that year. Richard was unable to provide any other identification than his passport. Chief John Case, who we discovered a few months later, was a chief petty officer with the United States Shore Patrol, said we could be detained for up to 72 hours without charge. We would not be allowed to contact the British Embassy or anyone else. Someone would come to take our fingerprints and send them to Rome to compare with Interpol files. He left us at five o'clock in the morning, promising to phone the embassy and come back the next afternoon. His final comment was that we might like to sleep in the cells where we, where we would be more comfortable. By the time we were both very tired and we decided to take a chance on the cells, belts, shoelaces, watches, glasses, coins were first taken from us. Neither of us slept very much, but the cells were clean with large trestles on which rested green foam covered mattresses. We tried tapping walls and pipes so we could communicate if we were left there to rot. Unfortunately, neither of us knew Morse code. We were let out at 8am to have our palm and fingerprints taken again. The man who took mine took prints of my thumb and forefinger on my left hand but after the middle finger he forgot which way he was working and had to start again. There were moments of amusement during our detention. We sat in the reception and were provided with cups of coffee. There was nothing to do and nothing to read apart from an interior ministry public order magazine which we took away with us later as a souvenir. At 1pm we were brought more coffee and a couple of sweet brioche, first food we had had since the previous evening. Petty Officer John Case did not return and we wondered how long we would be kept there. We travelled independently to Italy and if we were not released we would not be missed at home until we failed to arrive back in England a week later. There was nothing we could do but sit on the plastic chairs and wait. Look out the window at some houses beyond the spiked fence and look once again at the photos in the Public Order magazine. We chatted to one of the young Carabinieri men, Lorenzo who spoke some English about gay rights in Italy and about Lebanon, which he had visited. <clears throat> the wife of a corporal came in to stare at us and went away again. And a playful puppy called Rocky with big paws and fleas appeared and bit my arm. By evening, we were quite hungry. It was now 24 hours since we'd eaten a meal, but we were offered food we gave the carabinieri some of the cash that had been taken off us the night before and they brought us a couple of brioche, a large calzone pizza and a cappuccino. Later on a woman arrived, the mother of Lorenzo, who we talked with earlier. What have you done? she asked. Nothing, we replied. 
Was there anything we wanted? Yes. We want to speak to the British Embassy. <clears throat> no, she could not arrange that. Her son would get into trouble if she did. Could we have some soap to wash ourselves? Yes, we could, and she returned with a bar of soap. And what a luxury that was. A pity we hadn't asked for a towel too, so we dried ourselves on the curtains. <laughs> we spent the second night in the cells. We had had only three hours sleep the night before, so I slept well. Dreamed I was in Russia, cooking something over a cauldron and being chased by a dog with rabies. We stayed in the cells until 10 in the morning and were only let out after making a lot of noise shouting and banging on the metal cell doors. Another day of the plastic chairs looking at the Carabinieri magazine was about to begin. But Commandant Tattarelli was in a good mood. Gone with the shorts and t-shirt of yesterday, now in full uniform. Was there anything we wanted from our hotel? Yes, some books to read and our pocket radio. A young man was sent to the hotel and came back with Saville and a passage to India and a hairdryer. Well, it was 1985 and I did have a lot of hair, which had been mistaken for the pocket radio. There was much mirth among the Carabinieri boys. Around midday, our hotel manager arrived and asked us if we would like some lunch and came back with wicker baskets full of chips, aubergines, spaghetti and tomatoes, bread, pork steaks, stuffed peppers, meat pies, plums and nectarines. It was a wonderful and unexpected feast, which appeared later on the hotel bill. Unsure if we would get another meal, we kept back the pies for emergency rations. And then it was back to silence, apart from the clickety-clacking of the typewriter down the corridor and occasional bursts of police radio communication. The doors were opened and we were allowed to sit on the steps facing the compound, watching a procession of ants moving from one side of the top step to the other and throwing things to Rocky, who had appeared from somewhere. We still hoped for Petty Officer John Case to come back to us and mid-afternoon the roller gates scraped open and a car pulled into the compound. The gates started to roll back into place and then got stuck, wouldn't open or close any further. We sat there looking at this route of escape. Should we make a run for it? It was such a temptation. But we knew there was nowhere we could go apart from the hotel. Making a phone call would entail a long wait in a telephone shop, waiting for an international connection, and our money was still in Commander Tatarelli's drawer. Our freedom would have been short-lived, so we stayed put. Our anxiety was only relieved when the gates finally clanged shut and we no longer had the opportunity to leave. But our anxiety was replaced by an element of shame that we'd chosen to remain imprisoned when we could have made a bid for liberty. That was the lowest point for us. What at first had seemed a big joke had become an ordeal, amusement replaced by anger, then by passivity. It was a beautiful day and we were still there with no prospect of getting out. At 5pm, Commandante Tattarelli appeared from his office to say that he'd had a phone message from the Ministry of the Interior in Rome with instructions that had come from Germany that we were to be released but we had to wait for a statement to be drawn up and sign it. We asked for an interpreter and an English-speaking Dane working at the hotel arrived. At 7.30pm the statement had been translated, but we did not sign it because the Commandante then forgot to ask us to. Commandante Tattarelli said he had been given no more information about the order for detention but understood that we'd been followed since we arrived at Naples airport the previous week. So my sense that we'd been followed had been right and after handshakes all round we were returned to our hotel by police car. An old banger this time, not a limousine, 
almost two days after we had been taken. Our first task after release was to phone the British consulate in Naples, but the phone was not answered. We then phoned our good friend Paul Hodinot, who was staying at our house in Nottingham, to ask him to phone the Press Association and Reuters. We were concerned that if no one knew about our arrest and release, we might be detained again if we moved beyond Vico. We were not detained again. And in our remaining time in Italy, we visited the island of Capri, Pompeii, and the Amalfi Coast, and Salerno. There was also a message left at our hotel one evening from a journalist, David Rose, who had picked up our story from the Press Association. He was from the Daily Mail, and we gave him an interview. Nothing appeared in the mail, but there was a report next to a large pair of boobs on page three of the Sun, headlined, What a Pizza Cheek. But the only thing they got right was the length of our detention, 47 hours. In the days and weeks that followed after we arrived home, articles appeared in the Nottingham Post, The Guardian, New Socialist, Outrage and Gay Times, and as far afield as the Brisbane Sunday Mail and the Singapore Straits Times. Meanwhile, we enlisted the help of Dennis Skinner MP. Our local MP was a Tory bigot. And so began a stream of correspondence with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to complain about the unanswered phone calls to the Embassy and the lack of support we'd had from the British Embassy after our release. The only outcome we received came from the Italian Embassy in London. An offer of seven days free accommodation in Sorrento. An offer we could refuse.